Uh, this is the Generative Commons call on Wednesday, July 14th, 2021, Bastille Day. <laughs> yeah, so we can honor the pieces who were beheaded, the people who were beheaded, I don't know. What do you drink or do on Bastille Day? So we eat cake. Yeah, we Big should eat friend. cake. <laughs> <laughs> um, so okay, so we should we should bring ourselves back to the generative comments. Also, um, my old friend Sebastian Hassinger and I had a catch up call uh, last Friday, I guess it was, and we were just sort of going to catch up and, and and so forth. And it turned out that what he's doing from within IBM is really, really resonant with OGM and in particular with the generative commons ideas. So I'm hoping he uh, has a chance to drop in here. Uh, I don't know, I pinged him a little bit, but, um, but we will see. Um, so let me stop for a second and just check in with both of you and see like, where are you relative to this particular topic? Stacy. <laughs> <Lead off. laughs> I can't hear you very well. Oh, yeah, your voice is really low, Mark. Uh, okay, let me see if I can adjust my setup. Um, I'm going to take a moment to to get uh, a Ear earbuds or something. Yeah, that'll probably help a lot. Yeah, because you're just a little far from your laptop or whatever you're you're on. Um. I oh, said, so did he want me to start off? <laughs> so, uh, he, was, he, was, he was passing the, the con to you, yes. Yeah, I mean, I'm just coming here to see where I might be able to help out. And that's why I'm here. Makes sense, thank you, thank you. And, and I'm, for me, it's like, uh, we have all these standing calls every week and I have to kind of pick up and re like reload the program in my head when we start each of the sessions because it's like, okay, we got somewhere interesting last week. Um, you know, and I don't, it's very funny because uh, my memory doesn't work well enough that I can just go like click into where I was at the end of last call that like, I have no idea. I have to sort of go wandering around and, and pick it back up again somehow. And uh, we're not keeping notes in a way that makes me easily able to just sort of go pick them up and keep going. Although I could scroll back up on the Mattermost, which is probably a good idea. Um, can you put it back in the chat for me so I can click on it? You bet. Thank you. Here's the Mattermost chat for this call. There we go. Thank you. <clears throat> uh -huh. <clears throat> um, and the general, I mean, the, our, our general concept for generative commons is to try to figure out uh, an agreement or an envelope or a wrapper or a threshold or a ground set of ground rules like the Marquis of Queensbury rules for boxing or whatever, uh, so that people coming into projects that are meant to improve the commons uh, and might be moving a whole bunch of different people's ideas around together know what the ground rules are and how to work together uh, with an understanding, with a couple understandings, I guess. One of them being that in general, uh, efforts are, are intended toward feeding or curating or nurturing the commons, but that people need to make a living in different ways so that we, we will find out, like we'll figure out, okay, so how do, you, how do you make both of those things work really, really well together? Um, because there's, you know, um, this is a, maybe a bad analogy, but um, in wilderness areas in the US and national parks, we like move all the people off, like people aren't allowed to live there. And it turns out that humans who know what they're doing are really good for the landscape. They've done a whole bunch of studies where uh, they, if, the, if you go to indigenous areas that uh, indigenous people still are allowed to live in, which is fewer and fewer places on earth, but the biodiversity in those areas and other kinds of markers of, of health are higher than in plain old wilderness areas. And also people like that understand how to do controlled burns, usually often, and a bunch of other things so that the risk of those areas is lower. And what we've got now is kind of uncontrolled areas. So by analogy, I think a piece of what we're trying to do is not wall off commons, but rather create a dynamic that allows for generative commons while letting people thrive in that territory, so to speak. Did that analogy work at all? Can I just ask a naive question? 
please. Can you just define exactly what it is we want for the commons? Um, so what we would like, I think, and I'll, I don't know that I'll phrase this great, um, we would like the commons, and, and there's old commons and new commons. The new commons are information commons. The old commons are things like forests, healthy soil, uh, clean water, uh, things that we use, you know, the, the, and the prototypical one is the common where you graze the, the sheep together in town, right? Um, and so managing com and fisheries are, are all, all of those are old commons. The new commons are all like the data that's available to us when we browse around on the inner tubes. And there's some companies that make a living, a really good living from giving us better access to the commons like Google, right? So Google goes out there and, and it's crawls the commons, indexes them, does a whole bunch of other magic and makes it so that you can type something in and in, in, in like milliseconds, you get pop back an answer of something that exists in the, in the digital commons, in the new commons. But the problem is that uh, over and over again, there's efforts to enclose the commons. People are not motivated to put things in the commons. Very few people are trying to connect things that exist in the commons and make something bigger and better out of them. So a generative commons is one that just gets more useful over time. And, um, help civilization thrive. I mean, uh, you know, I think I think the, the highest goal here is uh, to make things available to make information available to people who need it when they need it. Uh, and, and, and then connected to that are people who understand how that information can be applied, right? Because this isn't just about a sort of information, it's about it's about usefulness, applicability of information. And so one example I go back to often in this discussion is uh, Piragaji, liberating structures, and wise democracy pattern language. These are three really interesting pattern languages created by experts in the field, which are kind of trapped inside of PDFs or Kindle book, Kindle eBooks, or websites nobody knows about, right? And what it, could we do the simple work of instrumenting them so that they're just way more available? Uh, so that they're better known and so that people who reach a problem like, hey, my group is kind of stuck, I just don't know what to do, could consult some kind of resource that lets them choose, choose from among the wisdom that's buried in these pattern languages, pick, pick a couple things, learn how to do them, uh, and go ahead and do them. And then, you know, that wouldn't take a, I, that would take some, some cleverness in, in the sense of there's probably a chat bot that has to exist in there. And there's probably some linking of, of bodies of knowledge. There might be a couple other things, but if we manage to prototype some of those things, then other people could say, oh, we've got a pattern language that solves for this and here's how it fits. And then we, and then we would help people kind of fit the knowledge in a, together into a, an open space where it would be much more useful, right? As opposed to everybody just sort of curating lists of links, which is, which is where we are right now, right? That make sense? It it does. Is there such a so? And you know, forgive my you know ignorance of this topic, but you're asking good questions. <laughs> okay, is is there a program that let's say I was writing a paper on something that would pick up every source that I had plugged into as I was writing that paper? You mean that would analyze the content of what you're writing as you're writing it, and then go no. go research go research the no. web? I mean that I'm sitting at the computer. And I put in my Google search and I pull up an article and I read it and I use something from there in the paper and I continuously do that. And by the time my paper is done, I have a whole list of all the different places and articles that I visited. So there's uh, sort of there's um, two um, pieces of bibliographic software that uh, all kinds of academics use. One of them is called Mendeley. Um, and I'm, I'm looking at the other one in my brain, but my brain is getting slow. There's actually several, but Mendeley and Zotero, Z-O-T-E-R-O. -E um, those are the two really popular ones. And they're actually quite popular. And okay. when, you, when you're busy doing research, every time you hit a page that you think you're gonna wanna reference, you, you basically drop it into, there's a little you know, Chrome extension or whatever, you press the button and it saves a properly cited bibliographic reference to that page. So that when you write your paper and you make the quote, you just blop, drop it in from Zotero or whatever and on your way. So make makes ac academic publishing easier. I don't know that these are connected. They should be, but I don't know that they're connected to hypothesis, which is a different thing altogether, but is interesting here too. And hypothesis is one of the projects we'd like to, to sort of connect to. And I'll, I'll put these links in the Mattermost chat in a second. 
Um, but hypothesis is sort of like a shadow, a shadow web where you can go to any page and using hypothesis, you can highlight some text on that page, an arbitrary web page, and then you can make comments to your highlight. And then you get you you create an account on hypothesis, uh, and then you basically your annotations to the web to any page on the web become a thing you can refer to. So there there's like a link to your comment, and then we could we could just generate a discussion about a paragraph in an arbitrary article on the web using hypothesis. So that's kind of interesting, mm -hmm. and I don't it would be it would be clearly be useful if Zotero and hypothesis collaborated so that the link was properly cited. Blah blah blah. I have no idea if they've done that. Hypothesis is an open source project run by a guy named, started by a guy named Dan Whaley, uh, who I'm familiar with. Uh, and one of the groups that I'd like to reach out to for, for OGM as we start to figure out what infrastructure we'd like to, to help build. And Michael, um, factor plus hypothesis might be a really, really interesting sort of combo. Yeah. Uh, and, and I don't, um, I don't, other than Dan Whaley, I don't know who is a hypothesis expert who's like really up to it. But I know that there's a couple of OGMers, maybe Marc Antoine and a couple others, who uh, have used it a lot and are pretty pretty familiar with what it does. So, one last question. Please, it, it doesn't need to be the last, actually. <laughs> who are the people in this group that are used to like putting, you know, that are more on the business end, like you know, um, negotiating deals between companies, stuff like that. Um, well, Matt Saia is the founder of Collective Next, and he hasn't been around for the last three, four weeks because he had a huge pro client project and then he took a vacation. Um, but he started a company that has a bunch of employees in Boston uh, and is used to, you know, doing those kinds of things. Uh, you know, he's a he's 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 his own company's biz dev guy as well. I mean, he has biz dev people, but he's kind of like you know, closing these deals for 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 client companies. Um, then we have a bunch of we have, I don't know about a bunch. We have other people who run businesses or are business oriented or really care about doing that, um, but not a ton. I'm sort of going through the like the, the the role of people who are here. We have Michael, who's the founder of a business and is trying to figure out what's the right mix of features and business models uh, to do something significant and different in the world. Uh, but Michael, I, I, are you a macher in the in the negotiating world? Are you like a like a? Does that describe you? You're mute. Yeah. You're muted. Uh, I get by. I'm not. I'm not a hustler. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, I've I've uh, I've made my share of deals um, over the years. Yeah, I'm, I'm familiar. You know, I've worked with lots of deal makers and and you know been in on a lot of deals. So. Yeah, Sadly and I was actually being an ace myself. But I was actually asking Sorry. about the creative part of it anyway, more so than the you know, mm. the heavy negotiating yeah. part. So that would be you. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm familiar with like, you know, business structures and and business models and um, things that I've seen work and not work in the past, even from a consulting point of view. So, yeah. And your focus is education and, did I hear that right? Um, really our focus, you know, and my focus is, is information, uh, sharing and management, personal and small group, um, fanning out to, to public, fanning out to the commons. So, you know, that's why I'm here. Um, and yeah, um, I mean, some of the things that, that Jerry was just talking about are things that one can rudimentarily do on factor. Factor doesn't generate Am I am I coming through okay? Can you hear me better? With you're a little bit loud. You're a little bit louder, but not that much louder. But you are coming through better. Yeah. And I'll turn my I'll turn my volume up too. That'll help. Okay. Yep. You're good. Um, yeah. Um, I mean the the actual generation of a proper citation that it sounds like you get with um, the the two platforms that um, that uh, Jerry was originally mentioning. Is not something you get with Factor, but the ability to just hold those bookmarks. I mean, if you had, you know, on, on a gradual basis, if you had uh, 50, 50 papers that either existed as a link on the web or were a PDF on your hard drive or, you know, whatever form they were in, you could um, upload those to Factor and, and have them there and clickable for 
for your use, but it wouldn't generate the citation. Um, and you could comment on them and invite other people to comment on them in that space. So there might be some use of per factor in what you're talking about. Um, and I'm putting but, less of these you know, factor is a Factor is a knowledge sharing platform that can be used in a lot of ways. Very, very neutral in its intent. Um, and Michael, just um, kind of putting you on the spot a little bit, but from our various conversations around the generative commons and um, there we go. Um, and our intentions and sort of the, the way we've been turning the soil here, what, what's the thing you're hoping this actually sort of might achieve? What, 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 what's your What's your favorite source of value from something like a generative commons agreement or, or this kind of thing? Um, I think the thing for me is um, the, the, the vision of the generative commons and the vision of knowledge sharing that drives me with factor is um, the ability to to collectively um, uh, upvote and downvote the the stuff that is put into the commons and and thereby encourage people to um put good stuff there not bad stuff <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and and know that it will you know that that the cream will rise to the top um and and figuring out ways to do that 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 integrate existing um you know information sources that that turn the information that already exists um into more of a a useful, directed, ideally sort of rated and, and tagged library, which isn't really isn't really the objective of Google. I mean, even aside from the fact that Google's Google's business model means that its um, incentives are are different than that. Um, even if their business model was the right business model, it's not exactly what they're engaged in. Um, so, yeah, it's 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 really more um, providing the common interoperable um, access to the information that's out there that in, incentivizes um, people sharing. Because I mean, right now how you put something in the common, um, how you, you know, you can mark something, this is produced under, you know, a creative commons license of blah, 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 you know, that's, that's great. Um, but there aren't necessarily buckets in which to, to put your information to say, I mean this for this purpose and please, you know, experts in this field, please take a look at this and it, in a way, you know, hypothesis on steroids, some, you know, com combination of hypothesis and Reddit and, and but as, as a, uh, you know, sort of range of very low hurdle standards for just what an item is, uh, in, in the world. And, you know, one thing I think about as, as, a, as a project for us, um, the same way, um, and I, when I say us now, I'm, and now I'm talking about OGM and the people who are, mm -hmm. you know, interested in, in furthering the generative commons is um, helping not to create, but to, glean from from what's out there some 
simple common standards for what an informational artifact is. You know, like what what is it that an item in your brain, uh, you know, a post, a tweet, a post on Facebook, you know, uh, an entry in Massive Wiki, um, all these things have in common in terms of you know title, description, graphic. Um, uh, comment area, tagging location that that we can, I mean, I may be a little bit of a broken record on this chair. I'm sure you've heard me say things like this before, but that, you know, that we can just look at those things that are out there um, through the lens of factor or Trove or Massive Wiki or Hypothesis or mm -hmm. any of these things, but it's the same, the same kernel that we're looking at, and the the stuff that's done, the stuff that's added to it on one platform isn't siloed by the fact that it was done on that platform, but rather added and and linked on those interoperable uh, platforms with a, with a sort of low common standard. And, and I think you're describing a really important thing. And Stacy, um, I want to know if this next explanation makes sense to you. <clears throat> There's stuff that the Generative Commons um, Initiative cares about that is what everybody's sort of doing right now, which is like, are we putting documents in the Creative Commons? Are they properly licensed? Uh, are, are they accessible kind of thing? And then there's stuff that's a little bit new. And I think what Michael ended with is a little bit new, which is, you know, I use the brain, the brain has a proprietary data format. And it's like all my data is, is in a little like brain file. Um, and uh, Factor has its own format and its own storage locations. And so does Kumu and so do all these different tools. If, what if we created a space, what if we separated the tools from the data in some interesting way where the data was now reliable, trustworthy, but distributed uh, and linked in interesting ways. So there was metadata with the data and so forth uh, in some way that gave us sovereignty over data that's really just ours, but that mingled the data much more in this generative commons so that when I improved one little chunk, a node, uh, one of the elements that Michael's trying to say we should define with care, when I updated that one and you using a different tool came in and, and looked at that piece of data, um, your data set was improved because of my work on that piece of data, as opposed to when I made my little data better, it was better, but only in my little proprietary data file, right? So, so it, I think there's, a, there's an implied separation of tools from, from data uh, in the Generative Commons Agreement that's not the run of the mill, let's just, let's just all agree to, 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 to cooperate well here, that it involves a re-architecting of how applications work with data. <clears throat> but that might make the generative commons much more generative uh, because, because then we would be able to level up uh, using the same sets of data and, and, and living off them and improving them as opposed to always like a one-off. You know, I, I see analyses all the time. It's like, that's just in somebody's spreadsheet stuck in some corner of the world. And it's not, and they're probably not going to put the spreadsheet in, the, in a data commons somewhere so that other people can have it available. And then the, the second example that I use of this is um, there are some efforts afoot to get researchers to publish their data and results of failed studies. Because <clears throat> right now you're a, you're a doctoral student, you, you're a master's student, you do some work, and it turns out your, your thesis is not proven or you, you botch the experiment or something happens. You just get rid of all the files, you dump everything, right? Even though you may have gone through a tremendous amount of data collection, the data might be really interesting and useful, something broke, your thesis advisor hated the project, whatever. Um, but what if we published sort of data and then had reliability you know, ratings around it so you would understand if it was really just crap data, then you could deprecate it. But if it's useful data in any way, how do we put that in the commons so that the, all of our data and all of our efforts aggregate up uh, and start doing things? And, and sort of uh, Peter Norvig is the chief scientist at Google. And I, I, I got to meet him and he said some really interesting things that like when, when data gets big, when data passes a certain scale, it just changed what you can derive from it sort of changes in nature. Uh, you can just sud suddenly like you can do a lot more useful things. And I'm badly paraphrasing what he said because he's a genius about this and I'm like just wading into the waters. But 
um, we're sort of denying ourselves all the data that everybody's busy working on collecting because it's not in some space or it's set out in some way where it's findable and reusable by other people in different ways. So did that make sense? <clears throat> Perfect sense. Okay. Yeah. And, and so there's a piece of generative commons that's like an ask to developers to work differently. And I'm not sure we'll pull that off, but I think we need to articulate that. And maybe we need to separate that from the, the regular ask, like, hey, here's the here's first level generative. Maybe that means we have a couple levels of generative commons. One of them is we agree that we're going to use as much as possible Creative Commons uh, uh, licenses for all of our work and that our data is going to be put someplace where other people can find it uh, in this way and that way. Awesome. And then level two is, and we're going to re-architect what we do so that our data is completely reusable and that when, when we're busy sort of feeding off of and, and improving our data, uh, we're doing that in a way that collaborates with other people doing the same, right? And then that, that means like that any nugget would have version control. So, so if I was pointing to a nugget and I knew that that was reliable data and somebody else came in and messed with it and changed it and made it suddenly unreliable, I'm pointing to the older version. And so my data should remain uh, untouched and trustworthy. <clears throat> um, and then I can upgrade any of the little nodes of, of data, depending on my understanding of, of other people's reliability on improving it, for example, right? So, so you, I, I don't think that this kind of shared data messes up uh, each individual's uh, observations or uses or anything like that, but it, rely, it depends on some degree of, of version control. And, and as an example, Pete with Massive Wiki, what he's doing is he's using GitHub as version control for nuggets, which are simple markdown files. And I'm, I'm just waiting for him to do a little more work on Massive because I want to record a demo of saving a file, which is just a markdown file that lives in a wiki, that lives on a website, that lives in a presentation, and that lives in a brain-like display, right? Same file, and then make a change and see how it's changed everywhere. And so when I say PowerPoint, there's a bunch, there's probably a dozen, maybe 20 different uh, apps people have written, uh, half of which are just open source code that will look at Markdown and interpret it as a presentation. So one of the ways is a dashed line means new slide. And then, you know, bullets, basically, you know, star, star phrase, star phrase, star phrase, those are bullet points. You can embed an image that shows up in the page. And uh, basically the software knows how to interpret a Markdown file or several Markdown files as if they were a PowerPoint. And the software gives you left and right arrows, goes full screen, and suddenly you've got like a and you know poor man's PowerPoint, which is really interesting because the content of that page can just be a normal little plain file, as opposed to one slide in one version of one deck of PowerPoint or Keynote or what have you. And so we we would deconstruct presentations in that way. And I, I have wanted this for a long time. I've wanted my presentations to just be playlists. And then each of the pages to be editable separately. And you know, in, in slide sorter view, it would just be pulling up images of each of these separate little files and I'd move them around and that would move, that would shift around my playlist. But my presentation would be the playlist timestamped for the day I, I did the presentation. So that if I ever went back and wanted to play the presentation again, I would play that playlist and it would pick that day's version of each of those files. But if I wanted to update my presentation, I would say, hey, show me exactly these slides, but bring them all up to date. And so if one of the slides, for example, was an automatic database query of sales in the Northwest region, then that slide would contain the most recent numbers for all of that. And if, you know, if somebody else was busy curating a dashboard slide, that dashboard would be always completely up to date if we wanted that to be that way, right? So, so there's, a, there's an aspect here of messing with um, how data is treated and how apps treat data. That's not just about the sharing, but I actually think that that's like th this multifaceted access is really powerful. And we're not like, and maybe this doesn't belong in the generative commons agreement, but is a different uh, venture, I don't know. Hey, John, uh, thanks for joining us. Um, sorry, I was on a, on a riff and uh, didn't interrupt. No, that's that's great. Uh, I I like it. <laughs> I want to hear more, but I'm going to stay on mute because I'm driving. Awesome, thanks. Um, so anyway, thoughts? It, um, I, I come back to this a lot, but um, you know the question of 
of how that um, the mechanics of that are generated as a, I mean, for sure, that's our goal. I mean, that, that should be the goal of, of anybody, you know, who, who believes in an interoperative, um, interoperative access to commons, and, you know, freshly updated and gets better with time. Um, and is, I mean, when I, when I look at our group and what we're able to actually do as opposed to conceive of, um, I think, uh, you know, that, that giving ourselves the task of creating that um, from, from just a strictly technical point of view, instead of finding it um, and, and, you know, bringing, bringing together the people who could manifest that, which might, you know, <laughs> touchy, touchy subject here, but might involve your friends at Google, but, you know, uh, and, and, or Google, I mean, it's like taming, taming the monsters that exist um, with, um, with the presentation of alternatives from smaller, smarter players and, um, and good hearted, um, technical wizards um, seems like what has to happen. And if they're going, if the bigger players are going to be brought to bear short of, you know, to me, I mean, I think like a lot of the stuff that ends up being big leg legislative issues, you know, section 230, uh, you know, moderation, blah, 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 blah. You know, all, all the things that people fight over are a little bit beside the point. Um, and if we're gonna um, get somewhere legislatively, it's probably just about um, enforcing interoperability more um, and portability. Um, so if, if we can manage to make data become more portable and so that you know it's easy for people to say okay this thing I've got on on Facebook you know I want that in the commons or I'm gonna bring it over here to whatever other platform um, then the the membrane or standards that connect those things um, for for vetting and constant updating and that kind of stuff um, can't, can't be any kind of proprietary invention and, and, um, sorry, I'm, I'm rambling a bit, but, you know, okay. just, just to say that, um, it doesn't feel like something that we're gonna make, um, as much as, as, discover and agree to and probably discover, you know, different versions of it that already exist, you know, help get people talking to each other. Um, Absolutely. Uh, you know, find, find out who to follow almost more than we'd be leading. Um, and, you know, again, again, legislating to, uh, toward, you know, our, our outward push as opposed to like getting together and trying to figure it out among ourselves. Yeah. yeah. So, so total agree. And there's a general OGM principle insofar as we have any principles, but there's a general OGM principle of not reinventing the wheel <coughs> and of, of doing things only until we find this, that somebody else has already done this and adopting theirs and making it better. And you know, the, the reason we love open source projects is that if they're close, but not exactly on the thing we see, we can, we can enhance, fork, you know, a fork and pull, you know, re recommend a change and see if they'll take it. Uh, but, but 
I think that like designing this distributed data object layer is way beyond most of our pay grades. We may have one or two people who can dip their toes in that water and feel comfortable, uh, but uh, we're two degrees at most from the inventors of most of these protocols and standards. Like, like reaching them is actually really easy these days. But so, the, so part of the, the quest is to find the architectural components that really work and that matter. Uh, you know, and, and, and which, one, which ones to lean on, which ones to use. And, and so, you know, Tim Berners-Lee and the Semantic Web and W3C, and there's a, there's a bunch of bodies that have done a whole lot of work on different aspects here. Then there's the distributed web set of communities, make building dApps and building, you know, IPFS uh, is the interplanetary file system, <clears throat> which is actually in use. It basically shards up files and then distributes them so that I would save a, a, a mess of, of an, an aggregate of chunks of different people's files in a way that I don't get to see what's in the data, but I'm helping host a distributed file system called IPFS. That exists. It's the underpinning of a bunch of services out in the web. Maybe that's a component, but other people are taking other architectural approaches to solving the same set of problems. And if we define the results we're trying to get well, we might even be able to sort of hop from technology to better technology over time, which would be really cool, right? So some of this, some of this is way beyond um, certainly my pay grade as information architects and data scientists and other sorts of things. But rather than training data scientists on how to optimize their own data sets and use big data to, to sell me more stuff, I would love to motivate data scientists to figure out how to share data in a more generative way. And even, even that like shifting of attention and effort and intention could have a really big effect over time. Right. Um, yeah. There's something interesting in to me in, in what you just said that has come up a number of times as nominally an area of agreement and and not not that it's a, a disagreement, but a, just a distinction that I would draw. Um, I've heard you said say, you know, and just heard you say, do something only as long as it takes to find somebody else. Um, you know, who's, who's doing that thing better. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder if uh, finding the people who are doing things better and only doing something if no one else is doing it, but kind of the same thing, but, but not, you know, I mean, I, I, I think there are some, there are some things that are involved in the vision that you have, that we have, of, of OGM's effect um, that, you know, we know we're not alone in having that vision. Um, and, um, you know, if, if we were, this is an if that could be, uh, you know, kind of what we do, um, if we were tasked with um, assembling the world we dream of out of existing parts <laughs> and, and we, we had no option to create anything, um, what, what would those parts be and how do we work together to, to identify them and find them and, and vet them and, you know, and, and find the ones who are doing a similar thing and lift up the one that we think is doing it right um, and, and try to convince the ones who are doing it well, but not quite as well to interoperate with the one that's nailing it. You know, you get me. Uh, totally. Um, and I was just looking up hypothesis, which is under this thought, potential OGM architecture components. So this is just me collecting, and I am not a technician or a coder, but this is just me picking up uh, really interesting pieces. Not all of these are open source code, um, but many of them are. Here's IPFS, which I was just talking about, the interplanetary file system. There's also a thing called IPLD, which is IP linked data, which is really, really interesting. Um, and so I don't know enough to know that IPLD is better than some other sort of linked data initiative and there's a bunch of them. Here's my, you know, my collection of them. Solid 
is uh, apparently a really interesting project, which is in neighbor communities and self-sovereign identity, but is not connected to potential OGM architecture components. So I'm gonna fix that. <clears throat> um, and so I, I'm, I'm busy trying to collect these in the hopes that, in the hopes that at some point we have the literacy and the experts and the intention and curiosity and maybe some funding to go figure out which of these which of these piece parts are, are best of breed, which ones will work together, which of these communities is eager to work toward you know this this uh, shared kind of vision, and how would that work? Um, so so absolutely, They're like for example, this group I don't really know, uh, Disco. Uh, I've I've sort of been on a call where Stacco Troncoso spoke I think once, but, but he wouldn't know who I am. But they're doing like really amazing work uh, that is very much in line with what we're talking about. So, how do we, you know, how do we absorb, uh, uh, apply, uh, riff on, and then add in the pieces of the vision that we see, uh, and see, you know, kind of if, if nobody resonates with those pieces of the vision, then maybe it's not an interesting vision. Um, but but I don't know. We we have instincts here, right? And, and my own, so I used to be a tech industry trends analyst and I can point to a bunch of things that I saw and wrote about back in the day that, that, that turned into things like a couple of years or sometimes five years later. Um, I didn't name them the right thing, but I completely had the right ingredients and the right, the right idea of you know, where it was going and all that. You know, uh, at one point when, when buddy lists showed up, when instant messaging showed up, one of the things I wrote is that like the future interface of your, of your telephone just showed up. And it's like, I don't really use the telephone anymore. For me, there's a list of names and I see a little green light or a red light or whatever next to them in my like Google Hangouts chat or whatever. And that tells me if people are around and, and now I have way too many tools that do exactly that same function, right? WhatsApp, et cetera. But the, the telephone interface of just like a blank screen and tell me a phone number, I don't remember phone numbers anymore. Right, I know, I know almost nobody's, I, I have trouble remembering my own phone number anymore when I, when I have to cough it up. For ID of some sort. Um, so, so anyway, um, so I think that that there's a lot of interesting things that we're sort of plowing into here that that we need to find out who else has these visions and who else and who else has already plowed this ground and built some of this. And then where nobody has, let's see if we can fund a project to go to go write a really loose version of that code. And then um, see if anybody else wants to use it. Uh, put it in. Put that in the generative commons. Uh, so that people can come and pick it up and make it better and, and change it as long as they'll put it back in the comments and then we all get to use it. Um, John, did you want to jump in? Yeah, just briefly, and this, you know, just maybe something you've already covered. But, uh, mm -hmm. Censorship and the uh, bubble breaker browser idea and how do you keep things on, keep things accessible cause trouble for the, or that should. You're, you're breaking up on us uh, a lot. One of the, sorry, we're, we're catching like two thirds of what you're saying, but it just, it's, we're losing enough to make sense of what you're saying. Two words, internet archive. Internet archive? Yeah, no thinking in the potential. Oh man, you're breaking up worse now. So, so I, I, I think Brewster Kale is one of like modern era heroes and I'm friendly with Brewster and several other people who are at the archive who are awesome humans. And one of my wishes uh, for OGM is to just go approach the archive and figure out how, how what we're looking at fits what they're doing already, how to amplify what they're doing, et cetera, et cetera. So absolutely. Yeah, and, and I don't know if this speaks to what you're talking about, John, it definitely speaks to what you're talking about, Jerry. Um, when, you know, again, thinking of, of factor being just one of uh, a suite, not even a suite, a, a class of, um, of information sharing tools that, um, that tap um, publicly accessible information and allow people to to add tagging and, and other met metadata and comments to it um, and have those surface 
interoperably on, on different platforms, it seems like the starting point, and you know, I was, I was actually talking to, to Mark Caranza about the Internet Archive the other day, um, and you know, and want to see if that's, this is a possibility with Factor to take you know publicly accessible um, uh, information sources. Um, we were also talking to somebody at Wikimedia um, about this, but you know. Wikimedia, there's a there's a platform called um, uh, Cure. It's, it's something really simple like curator.org. I have to double check, but you know it's basically pulling up um, publicly accessible uh, art and and objects from museum collections and and such things, um, and you know then. Uh, public domain everything um and just you know just being able to peruse all that stuff through whatever um platform you're using and get the benefit of um the enhancements that that people bring to it over time um, yeah that all should be part of the mix sounds great that's what you're talking about yeah but, yeah yeah no, that's what I know. That's what you were talking about, Jerry. I hope that's what John was was trying to get through to us. Yeah, John, and I'm sorry, John. You're bro you you were breaking up so much. I don't know if you're in John, a better. You know, I know I know you can't really respond now. But one thing I'm really interested in talking to you about. I mean, you mentioned um, that you were um, working with uh, Clea Young um, on some stuff, and uh, I've talk to her too and I'm really interested in some things about um, how people's individual sovereign identities decentralized identities um, play in these arenas and just because we're in a small group and I know you're I know you're listening uh, love to talk to you about that um, I think there's maybe some some stuff that we could yeah test yeah that's great let's that. let's take that one offline that would that'd be great. Yeah. That would be great. Yeah. And uh, Kali is an old and dear friend. So um, well, I think what, you know, I, I think just, you know, inviting her into uh, a spotlight conversation here and seeing, you know, what they've, what they've got going and how it might fit what we're doing would be a great thing to do. <clears throat> that'd be really fun. Um, and then Doc Searles is part of the founding of IIW as well. He's a dear friend. Uh, and he's doing a bunch of stuff right now um, around flipping, flipping how advertising works so that instead of all of us being bombed all the time with offers for everything, to flip it around so that we put out a request that says, I'm looking for X, and we get bids on our, on our request. <clears throat> and he calls this the customer commons. So I believe he's got customercommons.com uh, and is trying to figure out how to do that. And then he has some traction with that idea at the Ostrom workshop at University of Indiana in Bloomington. So he and his wife, I think, are going to go rent a flat in Bloomington for, for a while um, and figure out you know, what to do about that project and where it goes and, and all of those kinds of things. And that's another neighbor project here. Um, so, so partly- That's really cool. And I just wanted to yeah. recommend that um, there, was a, there was a link you posted to a lecture that Doc um, did affiliated with the, the Ostrom uh, Institute that you said, yeah, I haven't, I haven't watched this yet, but you know, I bet it's good or something. Yep. And I endorse that, uh, and, and urge that <laughs> everybody here watching, it's a really good, really good kind of, and, 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 you know, it's worth pushing out just because it's a good, a good, broad, relatively accessible, how we got to where we're at um, and framing of, of the, the digital world. Um, I'm gonna post Doc's uh, Ostrom Memorial Lecture in our chat. Uh, bup, 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 bup. Gotta make a pretty, a pretty markdown link. And there it is. Um, Thank you. I'm glad. I'm glad that was useful. And and 
it's so interesting because every time we turn over a rock on, in these conversations, it's like, oh yeah, Kalia, IIW, we should go talk to them. And it's like, ah, Zotero, Mendeley, yeah. Or Dan Whaley, Hypothesis, we should go talk to them. And we're not, we're not at the place where we can just easily and rhythmically have these conversations and then do something fruitful with each conversation. We're still trying to figure out what do we bring to each of these parties? How can we get our sort of house in order enough that that we have a bunch of things to, to sort of offer and do? Because I envision OGM as 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 sort of like a, not just cleaner fish, you know, that 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 like the big the big grouper pulls up and the wrasses like bite off all the all the parasites and all that, but rather like we're a little bit more like Iron Man, where we can sort of attach rocket boosters and transform other entities by doing. By, by doing generative commons kind of jujitsu and, and other things. And I think, we're still, I think we're still in the conversational phase about what is that. And I think we're about to transition into the just build the plane as we go phase of just do, do rinse, repeat. And I just wanted to float an idea with, with you all that, that showed up sort of Sunday. Uh, and we talked about yesterday on the build OGM call, uh, which is uh, the notion of, of creating within, how do I phrase this? creating within OGM or making a central project of OGM kind of a pilgrimage to go interview interesting thinkers whose, whose ideas nurture the thriving future that we're all talking about, whether that's some aspect of data or there's a whole bunch of people who think they've got a solution to the world's problems, right? Uh, the 2% the, the or the 1% solution or the triple bottom line or game B or whatever. There's like a whole bunch of these. And if, if we invited them into an interview format and then performed some OGM magic on the conversation, which means the first pass is, hey, we're gonna record a Zoom call and post that on YouTube and that's, that's a, a show. But then I'm going to naturally be uh, annotating my brain according to the content of what we're talking about and you know, go, go with that. Okay, good, and, I'll, and I post that publicly. What other tools and what other kinds of analysis and annotation can we then add to that? Um, at one point, Max, uh, uh, Max Harper took the transcript of one of our calls and put it in Miro, and he's a wizard at Miro programming, and he made a visualization where you could see the bouncing back and forth between, because the, the Thursday formats were me pinging people from the chat, you could just really see that, and then you could also see where somebody said something that provoked a general discussion, and it went, you know, and then the discussion went to lots of different people, and then back to me, and and that, that was just one experiment uh, using the artifact of the conversation. <clears throat> so could we do that lather, rinse, repeat and keep, keep building on, you know, adding these materials to the generative commons. And then for example, pushing at the edges of uh, all of these people's thinking. So, hey, game B, it sounds like you like this, 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 is this like this or how is it different from this other community? And then working the borders between these sets of ideas because they're just, lots of communities that think they've got the answer and are not reaching out and looking at what how they overlap or don't overlap with other communities and if we manage to pull together better we i think our, our collective effect would be would be phenomenal and it, this doesn't mean we need to homogenize everybody's perspective but but a goal of this show would be to arrive at an ever improving sort of crystallizing version of how to fix all the damn problems that we're facing in a kind of a holographic, holistic kind of way. Um, and I just explained it in, in more academic terms than I kind of wanted to, but, but, but I'm thinking that, that we can start by just doing that and creating a, an agenda and then figure out what the roles are. And, and so Stacy, you started this call with like, is there a dashboard where we can figure out how I might help for the next two hours because I'm good at some things and I don't know where to apply that skill. So this project, we're trying to boil down to some project plans. Like what does this look like in terms of how to get it done? And then the project plans, we're trying to boil down to OKRs, um, objectives and key results, so that we can begin to say, okay, good. This week, I'm these are my objectives and these are the results I'm aiming for in, and post those publicly as Google does internally only so that anybody in, o, in, in OGM can look around and see. And then if we can aggregate those things back into some like task list that then filters in Airtable or whatever else, and Vincent has become an Airtable black belt, but if we can take a tool that allows someone to say, here's my suite of, of, of skills, what tasks on the task board match my skills right now? That'd be a cool thing to look at. 
you know, uh, on a day when you want to want to put some time into into doing some of this. So those moving parts are all wishful thinking at this point, but that's where we're heading. That like we're like we're we're moving toward that. And if if like a show like that sounds like a bad idea, speak up now, because uh, we're we're sort of building energy toward that kind of a uh, that kind of a thought. I, I'm envisioning something very similar with little tweaks that I want to think more about. Well, and and uh, toward what you said uh, a couple of days ago in conversation, like we need to take back the fourth estate. Um, one of the important things we could do is go talk to journalists, journalism schools, uh, people who are rethinking journalism, like the Knight Foundation, which has been pouring money into trying to figure out how to solve for journalism for years, but host a conversation specifically about how journalism fits. And, and one of the reasons I care a lot about this shared data generative commons, the, 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 the linked, reliable, warm, contextualized data, is that I think that journalists and educators and students and corporations and nonprofits and governments should all be nurturing common data. We should just be improving the data that we use together. And I don't know why we don't do that. Uh, when, when the Wikipedia was born, I was pretty sure that some educational institutions and some news organizations were going to make deals with Wikipedia to offer, like to, like to improve Wikipedia over time as they did reporting or, or classes on each topic. This has never shown up. Instead, we had grade school saying, for, for, you know, preventing their kids from using Wikipedia because it's cheating. I'm like, seriously, people? Um, so, so how do we flip ourselves into this sort of mass collaboration mode around what we know so that we wind up learning, knowing what we know and, imp and improving it? And of course, that's controversial. There's going to be lots of places where, where there'll be battles over information as there are just on Wikipedia, right? Controversial pages get locked every now and then. Awesome. But at least we're sort of out, out visibly with each other in, in these conversations. Well, the reason I had asked you about the Mandalay and the Zotero, Zotero. Right? Yeah, yeah, they're in I, the I was, chat. I was thinking more in terms of, um, and I, John, just I heard the word censorship, but I was thinking in terms of accountability and legislation and even requiring using programs like that. Uh, so that there's an actual audit trail of things that people are saying or are claiming, which would be, I just read Heather Cox Richardson this morning about the, the you know, Texas state, basically all the Democrats have left the state because Texas right. is trying to run a whole bunch of voter suppression laws and then anti every, basically the conservative agenda, they're trying to just pass all the laws. Uh, and it's like, uh, and just, just back to the big lie. Uh, and then also she writes about how Biden gave a talk saying, hey, the big lie is in fact just that. It's a big lie and we need to you know, worry about it. So if people needed to offer supporting evidence when they made claims, right. for examples, um, it might be harder for them to make spurious claims because what we're exactly. suffering from right now is that everybody famous gets airtime. And when they're ballsy enough to, to, to make outright lies, to, 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 to state lies, it looks like real, right? Because why would they lie? Like who'd be that motivated to lie that big? And that's the benefit of the big lie. Um, so yes, so I, I, I think we're sort of, sort of in similar territory there. I'm gonna have to fold up my pup tent pretty soon on this call because I've got to change, to change locations for a, a panel I'm hosting on the half hour. But um, any last thoughts for, for this from the conversation we just had? Just thank you. This was, for me, this was the best call. It was so, it was a great education. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. That's great. I love that. Thank you. Thanks for asking great questions. And don't 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 <laughs> apologize for asking your questions, Stacey. And don't ever say this is the last question because that'd be okay. very sad. I'll I'll be very sad if you're ever asking the last question. <laughs> I'm not going to do it anyway, but <laughs> I'll yeah, try good. to stop saying it. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care. Bye bye. You too. Bye. Thanks everybody. And and thanks, John. Uh, let's let's be in touch. Um, I'll, I'll I'll reach out. Perfect. If you can hear me. <laughs> That'd be great, Michael. Uh, look forward, looking forward to it. Cool. Take care. Cool. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye, Jerry. Bye.